Hello, my name is Kim Eagle. I'm editor of ACC.org from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm joined today by Deepak Bhatt from Boston and Dr. Pyle Coley from Colorado. We're talking about trials from the American Heart Association meetings, day two, and there are a number of them that we want to talk to you about that I think are important. Deepak, let's start with a trial called Impulse. Absolutely. This is an important trial. It was meant to build upon our knowledge from previous trials of SGLT2 inhibitors. The drug study was empagliflozin, and the population was patients with acute heart failure, either HEFREF or HEFPEF, and with or without diabetes. And we sort of addressed part of this in the soloist trial now, that was presented last year as a late breaker. And there we'd shown that sotagliflozin uh, reduced the endpoint of heart failure and cardiovascular death and that sort of thing in acute decompensated heart failure patients. Here with Impulse, it's including patients also without diabetes, not just diabetes as was in Soloist. And this trial was positive as well. It was about 500 or so patients, but a lot of events in these uh, acute heart failure type patients. And it was, um, I think, really quite remarkable. The risk reduction, they used a sort of newer statistical uh, technique, the uh, uh, win ratio. But the bottom line is it was a significant win uh, for empagliflozin, and a significant reduction in death and heart failure related endpoints. And uh, to me, it builds upon all the other data with SGLT2 inhibitors nicely, emperor preserved, uh, emperor reduced, uh, uh, DAPA heart failure. Here as well, the benefits seemed consistent in those with an EF greater than 40 or less than 40. You could sort of say HEFPEF. I know people argue a little bit about whether it's 40 or 50 or 60 these days, but seemed to be a consistent benefit there, consistent across multiple other pre-specified subgroups. Importantly, consistent in those with and without diabetes, really extending our knowledge beyond soloist. And the patients not only did better, they felt better on the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. So to me, this really adds to what is an incredible wealth of data for SGLT2 inhibitors. It's a great trial to segue into Emperor Preserved, isn't it? Pyle, tell us about the report from that trial. It really is. Honestly, I've been so impressed with the data coming from SGLT2 inhibitors, as Deepak just talked about. So this was really looking at empagliflozin versus placebo in HEFPEF. And now this has been previously reported, but this particular trial stratified it by LVEF, and it was in patients with or without diabetes. Um, so we're looking really at that 40 to 49%, and then greater than equal to 50% EF, which we think may be pathophysiologically different processes. Um, and this was a positive trial as well, regardless of the EF. So they looked at EF greater than 50%, and it, the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations was reduced by 17%. We had an improvement in NYHA class, in biomarkers, in natriuretic peptides, and a decrease in the slope of decline of GFR. So also positive renal outcomes as well. What I found very interesting was that the first heart failure hospitalization was reduced by 22% in patients with EF greater than or equal to 50, but total heart failure hospitalizations did not appear to be reduced. So there was a divergence of those curves that then came back together. But, you know, looking at this data, Kim and Deepak, I feel now even more confident using SGLT2 inhibitors in my patients across the spectrum of heart failure. Yeah, the trials have really moved us from HEF-REF to HEF-BEF and from diabetics to non-diabetics. And increasingly, it's clear the hospitalization endpoint is, is really especially affected, but other cardiovascular outcomes as well. There's another trial reported at ADPAC called Chief HF. Tell us about that trial. Sure. Basically, this is another win, I think, for SGLT2 inhibitors as a class. This was specifically canagliflozin, but again, the results should be extrapolatable to the other SGLT2 inhibitors. And what was studied here, really important, was quality of life. And the specific instrument was a Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. And uh, to the investigators' credit, they did a lot of this trial, I guess you could say virtually in, in the COVID pandemic and were able to execute it uh, quite successfully. But as far as the primary results, the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, significant improvement in favor of the patients on canagliflozin uh, versus placebo. So uh, to me, this is uh, really important data. Patients are feeling better. 
uh, and uh, this adds to the clinical outcome data with the whole class of SGLT2 inhibitors. As far as subgroups, it looked like the benefit was consistent in those with HEF-PEF and HEF-REF, and once more, it looked consistent in those with or without diabetes. So sure, SGLT2 inhibitors are great diabetes drugs, but now increasingly, it's looking like they're great heart failure drugs for HEF-REF, for HEF-PEF, for those with diabetes, those without diabetes. So to me, these three trials that we've just discussed are all extremely concordant. Totally concordant. I also love the, the trial design here is to use the EMR to help identify patients. We're, we're really moving potentially toward a different paradigm for clinical trial recruitment, which hopefully will be both faster and, and much less expensive. Uh, is that your, your sense too? Oh, absolutely. I think we've learned a lot from the COVID pandemic, and I realize it's not totally over, but uh, we have adapted the way we do clinical trials. It's taken a while. In fact, it's prompted us to make changes we should have made years ago that make trials more user-friendly for the patient so that they just don't have to come in for sort of a silly office visit for no good reason just for a trial. Uh, but it's also hopefully made them more user-friendly for sites and site investigators. Pyle, any comments on Chief HF? You know, I would uh, just echo what's already been said, and I'm really curious to also see with whether this is all a class effect or whether there may even be differences between non-selective and selective SGLT2 inhibitors. So I'm very curious to see some of the outcomes with um, soda gliflozin, which Dr. Bhatt has reported on. Well, since Pyle has created that opening there, they say, you know, the one thing that isn't entirely clear from what was presented here uh, at least from what I've seen, is just how do things fare at that very high range of EF? Because it does seem from Emperor Preserve, maybe there's some attenuation of benefit when you get into that you know, EF greater than 60 or 65, whereas at least in the Sotagliflozin trial, Solist and Scored, it looked to us like there was a benefit throughout the full range of HEF-PEF, including truly normal EF. So maybe some subtle differences, but that'll require further study to tease out. And I would also say I've really been reaching for this medication, even in my CAD patients with CKD, because of some of the data that we have seen with um, dapagliflozin and other SGLT2 inhibitors as well from DAPA CKD. So it's not just now a, a diabetes drug. It's not just a heart failure drug. It's now also become a chronic kidney disease drug. Right, right. with EMPA kidney, you know, due to report sometime, I think, relatively soon. The last trial we wanted to mention today was PALAX. This is a very interesting trial looking at the potential value of a, a posterior pericardiotomy during cardiac surgery. And the notion is that postoperative atrial fibrillation may be related to the development of a pericardial effusion, and particularly in the posterior, posterior pericardium where we have the uh, joining of the pulmonary veins that this may be a nidus for uh, atrial fibrillation. It's a great trial. They randomized about 420 patients to either have uh, usual care after heart surgery or a posterior pericardiotomy. And the rate of AFib uh, almost dropped in half. It was from like 34% to 18%. So it was an impressive result and consistent with this mechanism that we've sort of teased and thought about for a while, but this trial really seems to suggest it may be real. Deep Pollock, what are your thoughts about this study? Oh, I love this trial, uh, in part because it sort of showed what I kind of thought was the case. It just seemed to me, as others have observed, that, you know, there's a pericardial effusion, then there's some AFib post-op, and, you know, all those things are going together. One's getting in the way of the other. Maybe someone's saying anticoagulate for the AFib. Someone's saying don't anticoagulate. They just had surgery. They got an effusion. Tough situation. But if all the surgeon needs to do is a left pericardiotomy, uh, terrific. I mean, I think that would really... I help the cause in terms of the post-operative recovery, much less complex, maybe decreased length of stay. So I, I thought the results are terrific. And you know, it, it's a single center study, but I think has the potential to influence practice right now. I agree with you. Pyle, thoughts? I was just gonna say when I was a resident at the Brigham, it would vi vitamin A for everyone with post-op AFib, which is amiodarone. And I'm so glad that we're moving away from that. We're really thinking outside the box here and thinking about how to treat disease, not just with medications, but with interventions as well. Yeah, I really commend the investigators for doing this trial. I, it, it may change practice right now. If not, a second trial certainly would, I think, 
solidify this, uh, this idea as a, a something that can really have an effect on reducing uh, this complication after heart surgery. Well, four great trials from day two of the AHA, three on heart failure, that really are changing the way we think about how we manage these patients. Thank you, Deepak and Pyle, for your comments today. Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and we're out. <laughs>